This morning I'm reading from Psalm 122, verses 1 and 2. The word says, I rejoiced with those who said to me, Let's go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. The Lord's given us this opportunity. He's brought us together. And yet we are sinners, unworthy before him. So let us pray a prayer of repentance together. Let us pray for ourselves and pray for each other and pray for this purpose. Would you please right now, in one heart, one mind, one spirit, let us go together in prayer and lift up our voices and hearts to God in the name of Jesus. Mighty God, we humble ourselves before you. We know that you are God Almighty, creator of all the heavens and the earth. We know, Lord, that there's no other. Yes, Lord, you are the three in one. You are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we know, Lord, that you are holy and righteous, and we are sinners. Lord, that's why you have provided the way. Since the beginning of time, and even before that, Jesus, your Son, who became the Lamb of God, willingly taken my sin and our sin, to the cross, Lord, and die in for us. Lord, you redeemed us, but you were raised in power of the Holy Spirit, and your Spirit is with us, Lord. Let us worship you in spirit. Let us be led by the Spirit. Let us live by the Spirit. Let us rejoice in you with your Holy Spirit. Almighty God, hallelujah. We praise you and we thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, I lift up to you every soul. Every family, Lord, that's represented, Lord, that participates in this service, whether it's from home or here or wherever it may be, Lord, we pray for them, Lord, that they would have open hearts and open minds to worship you, that the Holy Spirit would lead them and guide them, would bring us near to you. We pray for those that cannot be here for whatever the reason. Some may be sick. Some, Lord, that cannot make it. Oh, Lord, we especially lift them up to you, asking you, Lord, to heal where healing is needed, to give joy where joy is needed, to lift those spirits up, Lord, that they may rejoice in you and draw near to you, Lord. Help us, Lord, because we are weak. We need your strength. We need your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us in all that we say and do. We want it to please you, Lord. And yet, Lord, we struggle. Because we think about yesterday and today and maybe even tomorrow. Lord, help us to give this time to you. To empty ourselves that we may be filled by you and your spirit. That we may be pleasing to you, Lord. For, Lord, you are our God. And we are your people. And it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Praise the Lord.
Would you please stand with me and let's go to the Lord and worship. And I ask that you repeat after me, please. Jesus is Lord. The Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Jesus is Lord. The Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Man, you got good voices today. Praise the Lord. As you're taking your seats, please turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Zechariah, Zechariah 14. We're in the last chapter, beginning the last chapter of Zechariah 14, verses 1 through 7 this morning. Sister Dean will read for us in the Korean language. Sister Dean, please. 오늘 말씀은 스가랴 14, 14장의 1절에서 7절입니다. 여호와의, 나, 여호와의 날이 이르리라. 그날에 내 재물이 약탈되어 내 가운데에서 나, 나, 나누이리라. 내가 이방 나라들을 모아 예루살렘과 사오게 하리니 성업이 함락되며 가옥이 약탈되며 부녀가 욕을 당하며 성업 백성이 절반이나 사로잡혀 가려니와 남은 백성은 성업에서 끊어지지 아니하리라. 그때 여호와께서 나가사 그 이방 나라들을 치시되 이왕의 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 전쟁 날에 삼국 같이 치시도다. 그날에 그의 발이 예루살렘 앞그 동쪽 감남산에 서실 것이요 감남 감남산은 그한 군데가 동서로 갈라져 매우 큰 굴짜기가 되어서 산 절반은 북으로 절반은 남으로 옮기고 그산 골짜기는 아셀까지 이를, 이를지라 너희가 그산 골짜기로 도망하되 유다 왕 우시아 때에 지진을 피하여 도망 도망하던 것 같이 하리라 나의 하나님 여호와께서 이말 이말 것이요 모든 거룩한 자들이 주와 함께 하리라. 그날에는 빛이 없, 없겠고 광명한 것들이 떠날 것이라 여호와께서 아시는 한 날이 있으리니 낮도 아니요 밤이 아니라 어두갈 때에 빛이 있으리로다. 아멘. Zechariah 14 verses 1 through 7. A day of the Lord is coming when your plunder will be divided among you. I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. The city will be captured the houses ransacked, and the women raped. Half of the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. On that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. You will flee by my mountain valley, for it will extend to Azel. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord, my God, will come and all the holy ones with him. On that day, there will be no light no cold or frost. It will be a unique day, without daytime or nighttime, a day known to the Lord. When evening comes, there will be light. Amen. May the Lord have blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let us pray, please. Our Father in heaven, mighty God, we humble ourselves before you, thanking you, Lord, for this holy word, your word, and thanking you for this message again, Lord. Your word. Lord, may we all have eyes to see and ears to hear what you have for us this day. Let us draw near to you through this sermon, Lord, and may, Lord, we be pleasing to you and have a more knowledge of you and more understanding of you, Lord. Lord, we want to be in your good and perfect will. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's return. Now, we must remember that this is the end of time as we know it that we're talking about here. We're talking about the very end. And I hope you realize that the ultimate goal of all history is that the Lord Jesus will make a personal appearance. He will come back and he will reign on this earth. Hallelujah. But before this literal and full manifestation of his kingdom, the earth 
and those on it must experience rebirth pains or, or birth pains as we call them, you know. And it's called the great tribulation. That will be birth pains for the earth. At the end of the great tribulation will be the end of everything that we know it. Everything's going to change. Everything's going to be different. Everything's going to be upside down compared to what we think today. You see, the previous chapters here in Zechariah have been preparing the scene for the return of the Messiah in all his glory. And he's coming back to establish his kingdom in Israel. Zechariah's name actually means God remembers. That's the meaning of Zechariah. And here, within this last chapter, is the climax of all of Zechariah's prophetic predictions when God comes to prove that he remembers his covenant and his promises to his people and he will establish his earthly kingdom. Hallelujah. Because of God's patience, you know, because he's such a patient God and a long-suffering God, many people today think God doesn't even exist because he's so long-suffering and, and so patient with us. His desire is that we would all repent and come to him and be saved. He gives us chance after chance after chance. But God always, he always keeps his promises. Always. Because God is faithful. And he will keep his promises. And during the second half of the seven years of the great tribulation, repentant Jerusalem has been refined and tested by the heat of the Antichrist and his army. They're going to come against Israel. They're going to come against the last stronghold. Apparently this confederacy, if you will, of nations has returned with all its physical and spiritual might to crush and destroy the last stronghold and the largest Christian stronghold and refuge that's left on earth at the end of the tribulation. They're going to be right there because that's when Jerusalem is going to be full of Christians. The Israel, they're going to accept Jesus. Those are going to be the remnant. And Satan will lead his forces and they will siege and they will finally capture Jerusalem and they're plundering it with the intent of once and for all that they, they want to stamp out all Christianity on earth. They don't want any Christians to be alive on earth. Get rid of them all. That's what Satan wants to do. And then this last hour of their painful need when everything seems lost, it seems lost, Hallelujah, the Messiah comes back. He returns. And this is the key event, which is uh, basically turns a, a dramatic uh, loss, if you will, or defeat to victory. The day of the Lord is a time when the Lord uh, he intervenes. He saves his people directly and physically in human history. It, there'll be no doubt. It'll be no, there'll be no doubt that it's God. People won't be saying, oh, it's a coincidence. Oh, it's nature. Oh, it's this, it's that. There's going to be no doubt. They're going to know it's God. They're going to know. Everyone will see God. Everyone will hear, and they will know that he is God. What a day that's going to be. You realize in Hebrew culture that the days begins at the setting of the sun rather than the rising of the sun. Here in the United States, we think the day begins when the sun comes up, right? Well, that's not the way it is in Israel. Their day, actually, the next day at sunset. Uh, and, and, that's, and that's why their Sabbaths actually start on Friday at sunset instead of Sunday, uh, Friday, uh, Saturday morning. It actually starts at sunset on Friday. It actually starts that. And so therefore, although the day of the Lord begins in the darkness of tribulation, it ends in the glorious brightness of Jesus' second coming. Hallelujah. 
So let's consider the final siege of Jerusalem. The opening picture is one of a apparent hopelessness and helplessness for God's people. It's against this background, if you will, of total defeat and very dark despair that the radiant glory of Jesus' return is set. Verse 1 says, A day of the Lord is coming, Jerusalem, when your possessions will be plundered and divided up within your very walls. Verse 1 anticipates what is spelled out more fully in the following verses. The Lord starts with a message that should help us understand something. <coughs> Excuse me. Should help us understand why he brings this situation to his people. This situation happens so that the Lord can return the spoils of victory to his people. The spoils here are called your possessions. Your possessions. What's our most precious possession? Why don't you think about that for a second? You know what my most precious possession is? I know you're thinking, oh, it's probably your wife, right? No. Our children, no. It's Jesus, my Savior. He's my pro most precious possession is Jesus. Here, the, pos the possessions of the people is going to be returned to them. And help us understand. He, he's going to, uh, the Lord starts with this message because they're in a terrible situation. His people's in a terrible situation. And this situation happens so that he can give back these spoils to the people. And, the peop and it's called your possessions. And these possessions are what should have come to Israel because of the covenant and the promises of God. My possessions come to me because of God's covenant and his promises to me. But they were allowed to be plundered here because of what? The disobedience of God's commands throughout the centuries. Israel had a really hard time obeying God constantly, consistently, just like us. We have a hard time too, don't we? We struggle. We want to. If you're a Christian, you want to obey God. You want to please God. But we struggle because we're still in the flesh. We're sinners. We're weak. What better way to, to receive your possessions than to have your enemy unwittingly bring them to your door as a prepara preparations for war? In other words, because they are being destroyed, the greatest possession is coming back, hallelujah, and that will be Jesus. That's certainly, certainly something to behold, but we see something here infinitely even greater in this passage. The event is a day of the Lord. By context, a day that is coming for the Lord. This day is distinctively and primarily His day. It's not our day, it's His day. It is the day when Christ comes back and removes Satan and his followers from the earth. Hallelujah! A day when Christ establishes his reign of righteousness and his peace throughout the whole world. Hallelujah. We can't even understand it. You and I, this is beyond our understanding. We've lived with wars and the bad stuff all our lives. And it seems like it gets worse. The day of the Lord begins with hardship and brutality as the nations of the world come against Israel as again proclaimed in verse 2. It says, I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. The city will be captured, the houses ransacked, and the women raped. Half of the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. I will gather. Here is a reminder that God, our sovereign God, is in complete control. Though the evil seems to be strong, God is still God. He is the Lord of history. 
and he is moving our history to his conclusion. He does not cause these nations to be mean and hostile, just like today. He doesn't cause the mean people uh, to be mean. He doesn't cause the murderers to be murderers. He doesn't cause the thieves to be thieves. You know what he does? He just lets them be their natural selves. That's what he does. He doesn't make them do that. They want to do it because they're sinful. We are all sinful. He just allows them to do it. He just simply uses the hostility for his own purposes. God desires to have these evil and wicked men present when he returns again a present so that so that they will be there and so that people can see what God can do and will do. The Lord allows the enemy to gather in overwhelmingly superior power and their advance is unstoppable on earth. They're so strong that there's no earthly power that can stop them. All the nations of the world are represented together in this one army against little Jerusalem. That is because they're part of this one world government led by the Antichrist. Remember, that's what's happening during the tribulation. Specifically, this speaks of the invasion of the Middle East by the Antichrist, and he brings his armies into Israel to consolidate the world. This last stronghold, this, they're holding out, they're not worshiping. You see, they're not doing what the Antichrist wants them to do. They're not worshiping the beast. This verse portrays basically an exceeding distress of Jerusalem. It appears that the city and its, all of its inhabitants, they're hopelessly doomed. Now notice the kind of people that these Antichrist armies are, and see if you do not agree that God, uh, they, that they deserve the wrath that he has in store for them. First, the city is captured. They, they capture the city by hate and aggression and physical power. And they will not tolerate anyone who will not worship their leader, the Antichrist, the beast. If you do not worship them, then you cannot be tolerated. Second, the houses are ransacked. They steal that which is not theirs. The greed shows in this statement. Third, the women are raped. They're violated. There's, you see, they have an uncontrollable lust and they are shameless, and they show they're the worst of villains because they're just trying to do everything bad. And fourth, half the city will go in exile, and they make slaves out of people whose ideologies, their thoughts, their worship is different from their own. Yet the rest of the people, the remnant, are not killed. They're left in the city. Now, don't get me wrong, it doesn't say this, but they may be awaiting execution. Maybe the Antichrist says, well, we'll just leave these here. We'll kill them later. Do all this with these. We'll keep these right here. They may be awaiting execution. And as these nations converge in an attempt to annihilate Israel, the Lord will return and physically fight for Israel. The people he cares about so deeply, he will come and physically fight. Not spiritually, physically he will come and fight. Verse 3, Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on a day of battle. Here is given the reason for the terrible and desperate condition which the Jewish remnant will encounter. Their very bad situation actually becomes an opportunity for God. It's an actual opportunity for the Lord to show that he is God. God often stretches our faith, right, by waiting till the seriousness of the crisis upon us before he answers us. You know, sometimes when we're praying for the Lord for something, he lets it go all the way to the end before he helps, right? And we're ready to give up already. We're saying it's, uh, it's too late now. God can't do anything. And then guess what happens? God does something. Hallelujah. 
Here he stretches their faith to the very limit. And it's a time of terrible horror when the enemy seems to be victorious and the future of even the remnant of God's ancient covenant people is in danger of total extinction. Then the Lord will go out and fight. In this hour of apparent victory of the Antichrist, the anti-God forces, bent on removing all the remembrance of the name Yahweh from the earth, the Lord will go out and fight. When all seems hopeless, when all the previous victories of refinement seem lost in defeat, the Lord himself appears as a divine warrior. Now, he doesn't state this, but based on everything I've read, this I believe this is the battle of Armageddon. Armageddon. It's mentioned in Revelation 16, 16. You'd like to read that, you're welcome to go back to it later. As the nations converge around Jerusalem, a series of wars occur ending in the valley of Midigo, uh, Mendido or Armageddon. And God has gathered his enemies together as a great uh, horde in one place to deal with them in the sight of his people. The words go out here are employed of a king going out to war and lead his troops. And the Lord has fought for his people before but never with the finality of this battle. This is going to be the end of all battles. There will be no more. This day is a day of the Lord when he takes vengeance on all those nations that have harmed his people. And when he does, it's going to be a physical return of the Messiah. Verses 1 through 3 provide an introduction by presenting the drastic need which only the omnipotent God can handle. When the nations are ready to annihilate Israel and destroy Jerusalem, Jesus will return as verse 4 promises. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half of the mountains moving north and half of the mountains moving south. On that day, again, it's obviously here defined as the day of the Lord Jesus Christ returns. The feet obviously belong to the Lord back in verse 3. The, you know, in Acts 1, the Lord ascended into heaven from where? Mount Olives, Right? And in like manner, he returned to the Mount of Olives. It was there that he spoke with his disciples about the end of time. His glorious ascent was a personal and visible event. His glorious descent will be a personal and visible event. The sacred feet of his resurrected, glorified body are naturally the first part of him to touch down. The Mount of Olives faces and rises almost 200 feet above Mount Zion, the Temple Mount. Do y'all realize that? It's about 200 feet above Mount Zion where the Temple Mount is and 300 feet above Mount Moriah. It dominates the eastern skyline from Jerusalem. When you're in Jerusalem and you look east, you see the Mount of Olives. It dominates it. And you know what? It provides a suitable spot for the touchdown of the most glorious one of all, and that's Jesus. The mount is the same mountain on which he once shed tears of sorrow over the hardness of the inhabitants of Jerusalem. That is also where the garden on the slope of that mount, where his bloody sweat fell in his dark night of his agonizing soul before being crucified. 
Mount Olives is so historical and so significant. It's no, no wonder that that's where he's going to return to. The same mount that witnessed his ascension, ascension from earth shall, fall, or shall also have his ma- magnificent comeback in glory. As the glory of the Lord departed from Jerusalem to the east in Ezekiel, so it will return from the east. Remember, Ezekiel watched the glory of the Lord leave the temple and then leave the area, Jerusalem. He's going to come back the same way. As the sun rises in the east, so will the sun of righteousness rise with healing in his wings in the east. Hallelujah. The second part of verse 4 prophesies a, a great catalyst, catalytic event. It's going to be great. It's going to be, when Jesus comes back, it's going to be a big earthquake. It says the Mount of Olives will split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and half of it moving south. I want to tell you something that's actually true. You notice how around here all these hotels and apartments are going up, right? Well, a few years ago, they wanted to build a big, nice hotel. And guess where they wanted to build it? On the Mount Olive. They thought that's the perfect place to have a really nice, big hotel. So they had to do a study, as you know. You know, you've got to look at the ground and check it out, make sure it's good and stable. But during that impact study, the, the build this, they discovered that you know what, they can't build a hotel there because there's this major fault line running right through the middle of the mountain. Right through the middle of that mountain, there's a fault line. They could not continue their construction. In other words, the geologists, they people who were studying to build the hotel, they discovered what we already knew from Scripture 2,500 years ago. Isn't that amazing? They couldn't build the hotel because there's a big fault line that's going to open up on the day of the Lord. Our Lord's feet touching the mountain will cause a tremendous earthquake. The mountain will rip in half from its very foundation in response to the actual presence of God. And by the way, this event is very well documented in Scripture. The divine majesty of the Son of God returning to earth on the Mount of Olives will split it from east to west, half of it moving north, half of it moving south, and it will form a great valley. And in the first part of verse 5, we learn that when this mountain of olives splits because of the presence of the Lord, it will, actually, it will actually become a way for the people of Jerusalem to escape. Just like when he divided up the Red Sea, he's going to divide now a mountain. He says, you will flee by the my mountain valley. For it will extend to Azel, and you will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord, my God, will come, and all the holy ones with him. Hallelujah. You see, the earthquake, when that mountain divides up, will provide a way, and the way of escape for the righteous Jewish remnant that are left in Jerusalem. Those who, I told you, were probably waiting to be executed, all of a sudden they're going to have a way to get out and leave and run and they will escape both the devastation of the earthquake and the fury of the enemy by fleeing into this newly formed valley where their Lord is. Only God's people will escape God's punishment. God says, my mountain valley. Did you notice that? What did he say? He says he called it my mountain valley because it was formed by this chasm, if you will, when he returns because the Lord Jesus stands up on them, one foot on one side and one foot on the other side. Hallelujah. 
and it's going to open up, and that's the valley that they're going to get out of. In earlier times, the Lord parted the Red Sea in order that his people could escape. In the last days, he's going to part not a sea, but he's going to part a mountain for his people to escape the armies surrounding Jerusalem. Praise his holy name. You see, our King of kings and our Lord of lords does not return without his attendants and his army. He comes with who? His holy ones. Holy ones come with him. The holy ones certainly include angels and most likely, apparently, believers also. And these could be those who've been called up to meet the Lord in the air or those killed in the great tribulation. I believe it's going to be the ones that were raptured. If you and I are raptured, hallelujah, we're going to come back and fight with the Lord. It's going to be his holy ones. When Jesus comes back, not only will there be changes on earth, but in the heavens as well as verse 6 teaches. On that day, there will be neither sunlight nor cold, frosty darkness. On that day, when the Lord returns to the earth, when he comes again and touches down upon Mount Olives and brings all his holy ones with him, in that great age-altering day, celestial events will happen. Like I told you, everything's going to be turned upside down. It's not going to be the same anymore. In fact, let's read a little bit about it. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew with, you, with me, if you would, please. Matthew 24. It's not very far past uh, Zechariah. If you want to turn there with me, please do. Matthew 24. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> 24, 29 through 31 is what I'm going to read. <coughs> 29 through 31, follow as long as I read Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nations of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Amen. Things are going to be different. Things are going to be really different. Praise the Lord. The day of the Lord will be characterized by super natural cosmic disturbances that's never been seen before in human history. The whole course of nature will be turned upside down as verse 7 actually indicates. It says, it will be a unique day, a day known only to the Lord with no distinction between day and night. When evening comes, there will be light. Now, a unique, a unique day because it is utterly distinct and completely different from any day that there's ever been in the history of the world. This day is known only by the Lord and no other being knows when or what will exactly happen. All we know is what God himself has revealed to us, and only God knows. One of the signs of a false prophet is someone who tells you he knows when the earth will end, or if he knows when Jesus is coming back. Don't listen to him, because only God knows. This light here could be the glory of God himself illuminating from Jesus Christ. He is the light of the world, and his appearing to usher in the new order of things in the millennial earth might be at evening. In other words, it's time to be dark. A new day starts. Remember, I told you the new day starts at sunset, right? But the sun's going to set, but there'll still be light because Jesus will be there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He'll be here. He'll be our light. Whatever the interpretation, it doesn't matter. You interpret it any way you want to. Great deliverance and glory will be bought by him who is the earth's only 
one and only rightful king. Don't get worried about the details. Just know that Jesus is coming back, and he's coming back as the rightful one and only king of kings and lord of lords. For he is the king of kings and lord of lords. And he's coming, when he comes, the woes and the problems and the trouble and the sorrows of earth are going to be over for the glorious day that will be. Even now, Jesus comes. Even now, comes. In conclusion, the attack of the nations here threatened the very existence of the city of Jerusalem. But then the Lord intervenes. He intervenes on behalf of his people. First, he does something. He gives them a way to escape. And then once they escape, he delivers them. Now, this will be a very unique time without parallel in history. Never happened before. And it ushers in a universal reign of the Lord. Many times the Bible encourages us to watch for the day of the Lord. Does it not? Watch and wait. Persevere. The day of the Lord is coming. Watch and wait. Persevere. It's going to come without us knowing. It's going to be like a thief in the night. Watch and wait. The Lord is coming back. The Lord's day is coming. What if you knew that the day of the Lord was next month? Now, I know we don't know, but let's just say that you knew somehow that it's next month it's going to happen. Would you start living differently? Would you start living differently if you knew that he's coming back next month or next week? Next month's only a couple weeks away. If you knew he was coming back then, would you start living life differently? I think most of you would. So, we must realize that Jesus could come back any moment for his church, for us. He could come back right now. Before my next word, I could disappear and be called up, and you could too. Or maybe you're left behind. Would you live differently? Are you spiritually ready to stand before God and give an account for your life? That's the question you have to answer. Do you think you're ready spiritually to stand before God? Because someday, one day, I don't know when, but every one of us will. will stand before God. Everyone. Are we prepared? Jesus is the only way to be prepared He's the only way, the one and only. No one goes to the Father except through him. Only Jesus makes us prepared. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to beg you, please, if you've not accepted Jesus, please accept him today, right now, because he may call us today. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, have mercy on us, Lord, for we are all sinners unworthy to stand before you. You are God Almighty. You are holy and righteous, and we are sinners. Lord, the only way that we can be saved, the only way we can have life eternal with you is through your Son, Jesus. 
For Lord, from the very beginning of time, he was your Christ, the Holy One, and he is your Son and our Lord and our Savior. Lord, if there's someone here today that's not accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, we pray for them. We pray, Lord, that somehow, Lord, you would change hearts and change minds, that you would bring them humbly before you to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, to save them from your wrath, to save them from hell damnation, to save them, Lord, because that's the only way is to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And maybe we know you, Lord, as, your, as our Savior, but, Lord, we've been backsliding and we've not been living the life that we know you want us to live. And we're struggling, Lord, because we are weak, Lord. Help us, Lord, to rededicate ourselves, Lord, to commit ourselves to you, to follow you, to obey you, to live by the Spirit. Lord, help us not to harden our hearts. Help our hearts to be soft, that we may come into your presence. For it's in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Let's all.